Okay, so I, instead of going into Matthew like I wanted to, I, I wanted last week and this week to be another two-part deal in Matthew. And uh, last week I kind of got thrown off track in a good way. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, all glory to God for that one, for sure. Um, but I, I thought, well, you know, since I can't have my two-parter, I'm just going to save it for some other time. And um, I would like to, uh, I'd like to talk about something of a very biblical precept in Scripture, throughout Scripture, but especially in the New Testament, called mediation. And I happen to have this. Uh, all credit where credit is due here. God u- has used J.I. Packer, um, a, uh, a a theologian who is relatively recently passed away. But uh, he has used J.I. Packer and J.I. Packer's writings for a lot of good. He J.I. Packer is a theologian and uh, and a teacher, and I believe he's done some ministry work. But most of his work is academic. Um, teaching over there across the pond um, and um, he this particular book is called Concise Theology it's basically if you ever wanted to know about theology here's, here it is broken up into basically two page chapters so if you wanted uh, to read about something in theology like for example randomly I will pick well start of a chapter here the incarnation you can read in everything that you ever wanted to know about the Incarnation in two or three pages. And the Incarnation, as we know, is basically Jesus coming to earth and being born. But he has, he's broken up this book into just dozens upon dozens of little two or sometimes three or four page chapters on various uh, theological principles. And one that I would like to talk about today is mediation. And before I get into mediation, I would like to ask you, and and I mean, you know, basically just answer this in your head, but what I'd like to ask you is to recall any time that maybe perhaps you've had a discussion with someone or maybe you've just thought about on your own other religions. Okay. Now that can get pretty testy sometimes. It can get uh, very emotional sometimes if you're talking to somebody else about their belief system, which may be different than yours. And you know, oftentimes, you know, I shouldn't say oftentimes, but sometimes we run into other believers that are, you know, maybe they just go to a church of a different persuasion, and uh, you know, I remember one time my. Uh, Oh, this is probably about 20 years ago or so. 20, yeah, about 20 years ago. My mom was a relatively new believer at that time. And she immediately found herself in a church. I believe it was of Baptist persuasion, but I don't know which denomination necessarily. This particular church, um, the women in this church were only allowed to wear dresses. And they could not wear pants. Okay. No big deal. I had heard of that, and uh, but we went to visit that church, my wife and I, one Sunday with my mom. And it, when you when you see something different, or when you hear about something different, it's one thing. But when you're there and you see something different, even as something as seemingly trivial as that, and I'm not saying that what they believe is trivial. I'm just saying it's a trivial difference sometimes. Um, then it really becomes more than trivial sometimes. It was kind of an emotional issue for me. I thought, who are these people to tell my mom that she, would, she wouldn't she would have been allowed? They don't even allow women in to the worship services or to minister unless they're wearing a dress. And it can't be a skirt, for sure. It would have to be a dress. And, uh, yeah, no pants, no shorts, nothing. And I thought, you know what, my mom is a hard-working gal, and at this point she was, you know, in her 50s, and she's had this whole life of just being this awesome mom, and now she's this awesome believer, and now she finds herself in this church that just seems to want to kind of put rules on her. So, 
and that's all I'm going to say about that specifically. But I wanted us to think about um, different belief systems. And, you know, we've all met people that believe other things, especially, you know, other religions. Oh, well, and now nowadays it's popular to say I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic. And I'm not trivial, trivializing that or people who believe that, but it just seems really popular nowadays to say that. When, in fact, I don't kind of believe it. I think a lot of people who say they're atheists don't really believe that, if you know what I mean. Um, but then there are other religions themselves. Um, forget atheism. Let's, let's go on to other religions. Islam is, is, has obviously been more popular in our American culture uh, since 2001, about September 11th or so. And, um, you know, obviously, Judaism, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, a lot of the other isms. And I, I used to think about different religions a lot. When I was a new believer, I don't know why. I didn't really have a lot of people that I knew that were, you know, of different persuasions. But for some reason, I really thought that other religions were super interesting for one reason I had just found Jesus I had just found somebody who can prove that he's God and I'm not necessarily talking about prove it in the scriptures but we know because of our relationship with God we know um, how God has proven his reality to us, right? So it's one thing to go around saying, you know, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. But when you have, at least in, in, within your own spirit, bowed to him, then you don't really know Jesus is Lord, I think. I think that's a fair thing to say. But, and again, I don't want to go too far that way either because we're believers, I'm talking to believers, and uh, hopefully anybody hearing this message online, if you're a believer, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, stay with me. But one thing that I thought was really interesting when I first found Jesus is that I started looking around and, and noticing, oh, there are other religions. I was 15 years old maybe 16 at the time. And I thought, what, uh, what is keeping these people in their religion? You know, I knew what was keeping me as a Christian. And it was Jesus himself. It wasn't the church I was going to, for sure. Right. A lot of nice people there. But I could have just as easily gone to another church and I would have known um, God's reality. Okay, you know what I mean. Yeah. And I thought, you know, and and that's you know, it's an it's an interesting thing to think about um, your own faith and sometimes spirituality and theology. But when you start thinking, oh, there are completely different faiths out there, such as um, Mormonism, popularly known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Yeah. I've spoken with them. I've read a lot of their materials, including some of their holy scriptures. And I will definitely say Jesus is not there. If you're looking for Jesus, I am telling you he is not there. Amen. Um, but it didn't stop there. I thought, well, what about Islam? What about Judaism? Well, Judaism seems so close to Christianity, right? Because we have... If I were to split my Bible roughly in half, half of it's Judaism, right? Well, that's true in a sense, obviously. But we know that God's reality supersedes just the Old Testament. It supersedes just Judaism. That's obviously the root. That's the root. Of, that's where Jesus came from. The Old Testament, um, the patriarchs, uh, his mothers, his fathers, his grandmothers, his grandfathers, or his mother and his father, not his mother's plural and father's plural. But they, they came from there. Okay? 
And so that's where he has his root. And so that's that's another different religion that's that's uh it's different from Christianity, but yet it's the same. Mormonism has some similarities to Christianity, but it's it's different. Uh, and so when you when you're looking around, when I looked around, I was at first I was confused. I was like, "What is going on here?" I was a new believer. Nobody in my family were believers. I couldn't go to my mom or dad for guidance because they were they were lost. I had just been found, and I knew better to even go to them for that reason. Um, the folks in my church. That was another story. Uh, I may have been better, better off going to another church, but will suffice it to say, I didn't really have answers uh, from other people. To, I didn't have other people to go to. Um, so I spent years investigating other religions, not because I thought, oh, well, I'm still looking for something that I haven't found. I knew who Jesus was. But I was wondering how people could find another Jesus that was so different than mine. And one of the big differences is obviously there are many differences when you're talking, when you compare Christian, the biblical faith to another religion. You can start line, you can compare the two and you can start lining up, well here's difference number one, big time, and you can start you can just number them. And then you can take that one away and put up another one, Islam, or Mormonism, or something else. And you can just, with each one, you can come up with a number of differences. But one thing that, that really interests me is when other religions try to, try to appeal to Scripture. Okay? We know they do that sometimes. Mormonism does. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They say the Bible is Holy Scripture insofar as it is translated correctly. And that means a whole host of things that are uh, that will easily get the believer off track. I can assure you of that. I've spent years talking or studying that church specifically. Another thing with the rise of Islam, and I do not mean offense to anybody, obviously, but I thought it was interesting when reading the Quran and studying the Quran. Uh, I had even taken a class on the Quran. Um, the teacher of this class, by the way, is one of the world's foremost uh, Quranic scholars. Um, he is he is now at this time he was he was in his doctoral program and he was teaching himself and i had the chance to take a class from him on islam not just the quran but the whole faith and one thing i thought it was interesting about that faith it was kind of similar to a lot of other faiths where you find a god and this god is distant. This God is distant. He's far away. Can you hear me? <laughs> I'm barely coming through because I'm so far away. I thought that was unusual because my God is right here. Amen. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way he says that. Is, isn't he though? Yeah. Isn't he though? <laughs> You wake me up. He is, he is so close that sometimes I feel as though he is just he's within every fiber of my being. Me too. Me too. Believers know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, stay with me. It's Again, I'll say, in, in Islam, the God, Allah, is distant. Okay, When you read the Quran, Allah will speak in the Quran. And it'll be, just like in, it, just like in our Bible, when, when God speaks in the Old Testament, there's a quote. And it says, you know, it'll say something like, Thus says the Lord. Or he'll start speaking, and then... Uh, 
anyway, in the Quran, you'll get a quote from their God, Allah, and he'll say, I am this, or I am that. Sometimes like our God does. The God of the Bible sometimes does declare things about himself. I am. Yeah, the, the greatest I am statement of all. And we're going to get to that, actually. But interestingly enough, and again, I, I promise you, I have studied this book, and it's freely available. Pick up a copy yourself, if you dare, and read a bit of the Quran. He will declare things about himself, just as our God does. And again, I'm doing the comparison thing. I do that in my mind, and that's I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just different. And um, So anyway, I realized after a while that one of the, the biggest differences between the, the God of the Bible and, say, the God of the Quran, or the God of the Bible and, say, like the New Age God of the 70s and 80s. Remember the New Age, all the New Age yeah, beliefs New Age coming through? Movement. It's not so, so popular anymore. Uh, like it was, boy, there was just whole bookstores and a whole industry surrounding this yeah. with the crystals and the healing, crystal healing and all this stuff. But if you compare God to the God of Islam or the God of Mormonism or the God of the New Age, there are many differences. And one of the biggest things is mediation. Okay? That's... I've brought this exactly. I've I, I've uh, I've brought us back to this book. Uh, Doctor Packer uh, has a little chapter uh, about mediation, and the subtitle of this chapter says Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man. Okay, he's pulling this from well, he pulls it from quite a few areas, but he quotes First Timothy two five. Paul said, or excuse me, yes, Paul says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus. Okay? This, this is interesting. A lot of times Christians, sometimes all we have to say in a discussion is Jesus. Sometimes that's all we have to say. Well, sometimes it's annoying. Okay? Yeah. And here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. If we're in a discussion about... It could be anything. I've, I've heard it in a lot of uh, discussions, whether it's about a social issue or AIDS or politics. or It could be something not directly related to religion. And, some, and sometimes uh, a Christian will chime in and say, well, Jesus is the answer. And that's all they have to say. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, when I say it's annoying... I don't, I don't mean to say that Jesus is annoying, first of all, for this thing, uh, from what I'm trying to say. But sometimes all we have to say is Jesus. Why? Because there are times when there is something in front of us, such as a social issue or, again, like I said, politics. Uh, it could be anything. And we know a deeper reality. We know a higher reality than ourselves, right? Okay? We're part of, and we've talked about this before from Matthew, we're part of two kingdoms, aren't we? We're part of the world, okay? I know I'm part of the world because I woke up with a headache this morning. (laughs) Don't you hate that? Waking up with a headache of all things? I usually have a headache when I go to sleep because of the day or something. I'm trying to rub it out from my temples here. But we know we're part of the world. That's been well established. But we are also part of a greater kingdom that's way up here, right? We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms right now. As sure as I'm standing here and as sure as you are seated there. We are seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms right now. If you're a believer and you're listening to me online, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, and you feel something stirring in within you, now's the time to start investigating. This is what I'm talking about. This is mediation. 
I don't want to read everything word for word. I had planned on coming in here and reading just a, a two-page little article that J.I. Packer had on mediation. Basically, it's about Jesus Christ and what he does in mediation. But I, want, I, I think I really want to more highlight the personal aspect of mediation to us. Because if somebody walks in or walks up to you and says, I have a book on theology. Let's talk about it. Okay, now for me, I'm super jazzed about that. I love that. If somebody were to ever say, let's talk theology to me, I wouldn't know what to do. I would be so happy. That's my thing, and I don't, uh, you know, obviously I'm not going to try to to force that upon anybody else. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when the rubber hits the road, all theology is, is talking about God. And what do we do as believers? We talk about God. So when you are talking about God to another believer, or to an unbeliever, or to God in prayer, you're really doing theology to be honest with you. You're really doing theology. So all of us are theologians. I'm a theologian. You are a theologian. I've I've heard you all talk. I've talked to you all. I know that you are theologians. (laughs) Yeah, indeed, yes. Absolutely. So so I don't want to get too heavy on the, the theology aspect, but I do want to I want to bring home with you, my brothers and sisters, that this it's not just a theological thing. Mediation, and again, I have yet to get into it, but we, we know who a, what a mediator is. When Jesus Christ, or at, with Jesus Christ as a mediator, he is doing something for us that the New Age gods cannot do. What does a mediator do? I've never been in mediation, but I know for sure that mediators physically get into a room with two different parties. Sometimes more, I guess. But at least two different parties that are in opposition to each other. Okay? And he helps the two parties come together. Okay? Now, obviously... You know, if you're going to line up ten different mediators and ten different mediation sessions, uh, you could have ten different, completely different outcomes. At the end of that session, maybe two particular parties are maybe even more opposed to each other than they were. Uh, But the the goal of a mediator is to step in, physically be there, and face to face bring two parties together. Okay. Does that sound familiar? That's what you're doing. Of course. Well, that's that's what Jesus does. Mm-hmm. Who does he do it with? That's all of us. Yeah. Let's let's get into that. Okay, I'm I'm just going to read a bit of uh, Mr. Dr. Packer's article here. The saving ministry of Christ, of Jesus Christ is summed up in the statement that it that he is the Mediator between God and men, from First Timothy, and let's read that again. For there is one God, Paul says, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Okay. He continues. He says, uh, "This is Dr. Packer continuing. A mediator is a go-between who brings together parties who are not in communication and who may be alienated, estranged." and at war with each other. The mediator must have links with both sides in order to identify with and maintain the interests of both and represent the other on a basis of goodwill. Okay? That makes sense as a mediator, right? Okay? So, if I was a mediator between uh, two, you know, two opposing gangs inner city gangs somewhere and if I wanted to be a mediator would it be in my best interest to be a member of one of the gangs it would not I can assure you it would not I would probably get shot by the other party by the other gang 
I would assume that would happen. But it might be good if that mediator were not necessarily a member of one of the gangs, but maybe, say, his, uh, his brother was in one gang, and maybe he had a cousin in another. Okay? The brother would want, if he knew that his brother was being a mediator, he would be drawn to that mediation, wouldn't he? Right? The cousin, that's my cousin, he would be drawn to that mediation. And thereby, being, being drawn to the mediator, he would necessarily be drawn to the other party as well, right? Well, and without getting into it, um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. A, because it is all over Scripture. It is all over the Bible that Jesus is a member of both parties at war. Who's at, who's at war here? Well, we were formerly at war with God. Not because we were necessarily you know, at war in the sense that we're sending out the Air Force at him. But we were at war with him in our heart. We're just against him in our heart, right? That's our natural inclination as far as um, a, a worldly natural inclination. Obviously, we have a new nature in Christ, and what comes natural is different there. But Jesus is a member of both parties. He is God. He was sent from, from God. He is part of the triune Godhead. He is, not, he is not one of three gods. He is part of the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's another sermon. That's another three sermons, probably. Theology all over the place. It could take us years to get through. And it would be fun. But we've just got a few more minutes. So, God sent his son as an emissary, right? Now, Jesus had a lot of things to do, but one of those things was to be a messenger, an emissary, an ambassador of heaven, as it were, right? But Jesus is also a man, right? Right? Paul says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay? It's fair to call Jesus a man. Sometimes I have people coming up to me, they're kind of opposed to me spiritually or as a Christian, and they'll say, Well, Jesus was just a man. And I'll say, You're right, he was a man, but he wasn't just a man. Oh, he was, he was a human being. Yeah, I don't have a problem with you telling me he was a man. I have a problem with the word just because he wasn't just a man. Again, that's another sermon, obviously. Uh -huh. But again, you know, I, I just want us to, to realize that we have the salvation that we have was won for us by a member of our own party. Amen. Right? Now, he isn't just a member of mankind, obviously. He is also, he's the God-man. Sometimes he's referred to as the God-man. Sometimes historians or people, sometimes theologians will write about the God-man with a capital G. And that's not referring to just God the Father. That's referring specifically to Jesus. We have a mediator who is a member of both parties. If he weren't a member of, if he weren't a member of humanity, he wouldn't be able to uh, the incarnation wouldn't happen. We wouldn't have a reason for Christmas. We would be still celebrating something else, some other Roman holiday at the end of the year. We wouldn't have a reason for Easter. Why? Because in the incarnation at Christmas, flesh and blood was born. Now, it was more than flesh and blood, but it was flesh and blood. It had a heartbeat. He had a heartbeat. He had two eyes and ten toes and ten fingers. Mm -hmm. And he was soft and cute and cuddly. And at Easter time, there was a man who had a heartbeat. And he had blood flowing through his veins and out of his veins. On, a, on an execution instrument. On behalf of his race 
Now, because he was a member, also a member of the other party, the other party, meaning God, that meant a lot more than it would if it were just me up on that cross, or me being born, or you. As sad as that would be, you or I. When I, when I became a believer, uh, about 15 or 16 years old, I was young enough, I was pretty naive too as a, as a kid, but, or excuse me, I was old enough still to really start catching on to these principles as I read through the Gospel of John or bits and pieces here and there from Scripture for the first time. And I realized right away that this God doesn't just say, I am this or I am that. He proves it. Who do, who do we listen to? Who do we tend to give our attention to? People that tend to put their money where their mouth is right? I know that from personal experience because I've got a big big mouth on me sometimes. And sometimes people around me, I just see them sort of, their gaze just trails off as I lose their attention. Why? Because I'm talking about something so much. But when I do something, that really gets people's attention. That, that happens in my life. And yeah, just, just like you, I, I really appreciate when somebody around me does something. It, it does so much for us. It encourages us. It makes us think, hey, maybe I should be up there doing that. I'll do that next time, or I'll help that person, or whatever, you know? It brings out the best in us, doesn't it? So Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man. Isn't that what we really want? When we're thinking about other religions, other philosophies, other lifestyles, we realize for whatever reason and for whatever circumstances are going on in our lives, we realize that we, we really need a mediator. Some philosophies will say, well... If you do this, and you do that, and you do this, and you do this for so long, or if you do this a certain way, you will have the approval of God. And more importantly, the approval of us holy ones who are the guardian of his trust. So you just, we'll see if you can fall in line, okay? Right? And that's funny because it's true. I know exactly why you're laughing. It's because it's so funny that it's it's not funny. It's sad. That's all we can do sometimes is just laugh because it is so sad. So I'm saying, isn't that what we really want? If you are looking at Islam, if you are looking at Mormonism, if you're looking at the New Age, if you're looking somewhere and you don't see the Jesus of the Bible... If you don't see the Jesus of the proven, time-tested, time-honored scripture of the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, then you are not going to find what you need. And I say, on behalf of all believers, that one of the many reasons that we are all where we are in Christ is because of mediation. You can't get that anywhere else. We are unique. We are unique because our God is unique. We have no we have no cause to be prideful or to be boastful. That's one of the many reasons that Jesus is is unique. He's exceptional. He's exclusive, right? He's not inclusive. <coughs> inclusive is a nice word that we like to we like to uh, snuggle up to sometimes in the 21st century here in America because we want things to be easy. We don't want to feel. We don't want to think. We just want to know that we're included. 
Well, Jesus will include you. But he will not be included. That's when I, when I say he's exclusive. Jesus is not included with the God of Islam or the God of Mormonism or Joseph Smith of Mormonism. He's not included. He's exclusive. He is above and beyond all that, right? That's, that's just another part of theology that we can get into. That's another couple, three sermons right there, you know? But again, boy, I just want to keep coming back to the personal aspect of this mediator. Somebody asks you, are you part of a religion? You could say, oh, yes or no. Yeah, you know, that's kind of a, a tricky question sometimes with, with Christians. But we can say, well, no, or I'm part of a relationship with God. Right, right. Or we can say, yes, Christianity. Uh, you can kind of answer that different ways. But one way, that a, a, a new way that we have to answer that is, we can say, well, yes, I'm, I'm part of a, uh, a faith tradition. Mm-hmm. Who do you worship? I worship the mediator. The really? The mediator, huh? Who is this mediator? Well, he's not a mediator. He's the mediator, right? Because where else are you going to find another mediator? I challenge you, my brothers and sisters here, and I challenge anybody hearing my voice, whether it's next week or 50 years after I'm dead. I guess I wouldn't be able to rise to the challenge at that point. but, But I challenge you, as long as I'm alive... I challenge you to find a mediator where you are at if you are not here in the Old and New Testaments. I challenge you because when you find out that he is the mediator, you will begin to find out why you need mediation. Right? We discover that after we become Christians. After a while we begin to read scripture, we realize okay, I'm an enemy of God. Not because I chose to be, necessarily, not because we're conscious enemies of God, but if you're not in Christ, you're an enemy of God because your your fleshly, unspiritual way and thinking and your lifestyle are really against God. So it's kind of interesting. We don't even need to know that we need mediation. Why? Because the mediator is so good that when he steps into your life, he'll let you know. He'll let you know. Jesus lets He talks to us, and he will let you know on his own terms, which is the best way for us to learn, right? Yeah. He's the son of the living God. Yeah, that's right. Son. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Amen. Um. I would like to to finish. I would like to close up here, leaving us with one final thought from Dr. J.I. Packer. God rest his soul. He was an awesome theologian, and I would have loved to talk to this guy while he was alive. He says, Objectively and once for all, Christ achieved reconciliation for us through penal substitution. He was penalized. On the cross, he took our place, carried our identity, as it were, bore the curse due to us, and by his sacrificial bloodshedding, made peace for us. Okay? You can find this all in Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. Peace here means an end to hostility, guilt, and exposure to the retributive punishment that was otherwise unavoidable. In other words, pardon for all the past and permanent personal acceptance for the future. Those who have received reconciliation through faith in Christ are justified and have peace with God. In Romans 5. The mediator's present work, which he carries forward through human messengers, is to persuade those for whom he achieved reconciliation, actually to receive it. All praise to the Son of the Living God. Yeah. Yeah.